models American motorists love are sometimes ill-suited to foreign markets due to their generally greater size and greater thirst. Some were nothing to write home about, but there are plenty other markets would have welcomed with open arms. Here's our choice of the best. Preston Tucker wanted to design a brand new type of car after World War II. His original design brief called for a padded dashboard, a world-exclusive safety windshield, a directional third headlight and a rear-mounted flat-six engine rated at 150 horsepower. As a startup company, Tucker raised money by selling accessories such as radios and seat covers before starting production of the 48, its first car. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission SEC sued Tucker for fraud when it heard about the program. While the court later dropped all charges, the ordeal permanently damaged the company's reputation and the 48 never reached mass production. Tucker manufactured just 51 examples, and none were officially exported. Nearly 70 years later, selling reservations before production begins is par for the course for startup car companies like Tesla and Faraday Future. Introduced in 1953, the Cadillac Series 62 Eldorado was a large, expensive convertible built to make a design statement, not to generate any kind of volume. Buyers liked it, so Cadillac refined the concept the following year and transformed the Eldorado into the luxury line chariot of motorists who wanted to exclaim I've made it in life the Eldorado evolved with the times, even switching to front-wheel drive in 1967, but it always remained one of the most spectacular members of the Cadillac lineup. It began to decline at the end of the 1970s as it moved to a smaller platform. It never quite recovered and the nameplate retired in 2002. The first seven generations remain the archetypical classic Cadillac. Early cars trickled into Europe via different channels, but later ones were an obtainium. Introduced in 1954 as a 1955 model, the original Thunderbird elevated Ford design to unprecedented heights. Its rear fender skirts, fiberglass hardtop and panoply of chrome-plated trim pieces announced it was a luxury car, not a sports car, which made it a unique proposition on the market. Ford built 10 generations of the Thunderbird between 1955 and 1997, and the model returned for an 11th and final round in 2002. Not all of them deserve our lust, but the original model stands out as one of the most gorgeous cars Ford kept at home. The original Ford Mustang was designed by Americans for Americans. It came to life in response to the Corvair, which Chevrolet assembled in Switzerland and sold in Europe in small numbers, but there's little evidence to suggest Ford seriously considered sending the Mustang across the Atlantic. In hindsight, the decision makes sense. Ford had plenty of demand to fill at home, and its major European divisions based in England and Germany, respectively, largely ran themselves. The rationale was if they want a sports car they can build one. They did just that, and the wildly successful Capri made its debut in 1968. In 2015, Ford introduced the first Mustang engineered with major right-hand drive markets like Britain and Australia in mind. After testing it, we concluded it provides extremely strong bang for your buck. The Pontiac GTO played a sizable role in democratizing the muscle car in America. Launched as an option package, the GTO nameplate adhered to the time-tested formula of stuffing a big, powerful V8 engine in the unassuming body of an otherwise mundane sedan. It became so popular that Pontiac turned it into a standalone model in 1966. The new marketing angle paid dividends, and the brand sold 87,684 GTOs during the 1968 model year. Pontiac resurrected the GTO nameplate in 2004 for a rebadged version of the Australian-built Holden Monero. The brand was on the brink of collapse, and General Motors was speeding towards bankruptcy, so executives had bigger worries than figuring how to sell a V8-powered coupe to Europeans. Although based on the Chevrolet Camaro, the Pontiac Firebird stood out with its own look that fell in line with the brand's design language. It carried Pontiac's image of affordable performance well into the 1970s and 1980s, at times remaining the only torchbearer in a catalogue of monotonous models. Renault's unlikely tie-up with American Motors Corporation AMC gave Jeep an outlet through which to distribute the CJ7 in Europe. It was a modest success, at least for a relatively large SUV competing in a small segment of the market. The bigger and more practical CJ8 never joined its smaller sibling in European showrooms, however. Interestingly, in the 1980s Renault imported about a dozen CJ8s powered by its 2.1-litre four-cylinder diesel engine and used them as support vehicles. 
Today, they've vanished into the pantheon of automotive history. Most American trucks were far too big for European roads. The Dodge Rampage still stands out as one of the few Europe-sized models to come out of Detroit, because it traced its roots back to the old continent. It sat on a modified Chrysler Horizon platform and it employed the brand's ubiquitous 2.2-liter four-cylinder engine. Its small bed could haul 1,145 pounds 520 kilograms. No one seriously considered sending the Rampage to Europe. Chrysler's European division was a mess at the time, and flinging a truck into the equation would NT have helped things. Had it been sold in Europe, it would have given buyers an alternative to mini trucks like the Subaru Brat and the Volkswagen Caddy. The Chrysler Horizon WASNT any more inspiring in America than it was in Europe, with one exception. Fame tuner Carol Shelby saw an immense amount of VW killing potential in Chrysler's smallest car, which wore Dodge and Plymouth emblems in the U.S. Tuning the four-cylinder to 110 horsepower transformed the Horizon into a proper pocket rocket worthy of the name goes like hell GLH. Shelby added a turbocharged 2.2-liter with 146 horsepower in 1985, and he helped Chrysler launch a limited-edition, 175-horsepower model named Goes Like Hell Small GLHS a year later. In Britain, the most powerful Horizon offered just 90 horsepower. Pontiac unwrapped a surprise for the Fiero's last model year on the market. 1988 bought a new suspension design that made the mid-engine coupe appreciably better to drive than before, a revised steering system and upgraded brakes. The 2.8-litre V6S output remained pegged at a pull through 140 horsepower and 170 pounds-feet of torque. That WASNT much but period roads testers agreed Pontiac engineers had finally turned the Fiero into a driver's car. Better late than never, Wright concerned about losing market share to European brands, Ford asked its in-house performance division to turn the humdrum Taurus into a true sports sedan. The super high-output show nameplate denoted a completely new type of performance car at Ford. We're sure it was met with more than a few skeptical stares signaling we don't do that here. Still considered the best of the breed, the original show received a 3.0-liter V6 built by Yamaha and tuned to 220 horsepower. It performed the benchmark 0 to 60 miles per hour sprint in 6.6 .6 seconds, an admirable statistic at the time. It was front-wheel drive, but that was passable in an era when even Alfa Romeo offended the traction. Gods by ditching rear-wheel drive. The Taurus show is now well into its fourth generation. It morphed into a full-size sedan with all-wheel drive in 2010. Japanese automakers launched a full-fledged assault on their German rivals in the late 1980s. Nissan positioned the Q45 as the flagship of its then new Infiniti lineup. One of the sedan's most convincing arguments was a 278-horsepower V8. The Q45 was a typically and unabashedly Japanese interpretation of a luxury sedan, unlike the LS which Lexus Americanized to boost sales and the Acura legend with rover roots. The Q45 hails from an era when Nissan churned out some of the best cars in its history. Like a proper range topper it was solid, comfortable and quick, and it looked like nothing else on the road. Europeans missed one of Japan's best German punching luxury models. Toyota dropped the forerunner from its European catalogue just as the model embarked in a bold new styling direction. It attempted to mask its utilitarian, truck-derived roots to become a more lifestyle oriented model equally at home in Moab or at a mall in the Midwest. The current forerunner launched in 2009 with a tough, Tonka truck-like design. It's the last body-on-frame SUV in its segment so it attracts adventured-minded buyers who need more space than the Jeep Wrangler offers. Toyota explains there's not enough demand in Europe to justify bringing the model back. It's too bad, because European Wrangler sales are higher than ever and the TRD Pro model is seriously capable off-road. Built in Indiana, the Subaru Baja represented an attempt to bring back the Brat. Like its predecessor, it took the form of a light truck built with proven mechanical components plucked from the brand's passenger cars, the legacy in this instance. Baja production stopped in 2006 after the public's lukewarm response made it clear the idea of a Subaru truck was past its prime. The Honda Elements boxy, plastic-clad body hid underpinnings shared with a CRV. Built in Ohio for the North American market, the Element existed at the intersection of the van, station wagon and SUV segments. It offered rugged looks, a spacious interior and available all-wheel drive. 
Quirky suicide rear doors made the element impractical as a family car, but its toaster-like silhouette allowed it to transport fully assembled mountain bikes a double as a tent for two adults. It has already developed a small cult following in America and Canada. Only Americans got the option of ordering the V10-powered BMW M5 with a six-speed manual transmission. It WASNT planned that way. Insiders sheepishly admit BMW added the manual as a no-cost option after receiving mixed feedback about the robotized manual SMG box from U.S. buyers and journalists. Roughly 50% of E60 generation M5S shipped to America had three pedals. While the six-speed manual returned to 2012's F10 generation M5, the take-up rate collapsed year after year as enthusiasts gravitated towards the quick-shifting automatic transmission. BMW chose not to offer the brand-new 2018 model with a stick because buyer demand dropped to near zero at the end of its predecessor's production run. Toyota introduced its science sub-brand in 2004 to lure millennials into showrooms. The TC joined the economy-oriented XA and XB models in Scion dealerships as a spiritual successor to the Celica. The front-wheel drive TCWASNT is enjoyable to drive as today's 86 GT86, but it gave young buyers on a tight budget a fun, good-looking alternative to garden-variety economy cars like Toyota's own Corolla. Toyota dropped the second-generation TC last year when it mothballed the Scion brand. Toyota tried squashing the Jeep Wrangler with the FJ Cruiser, a retro-styled SUV inspired by the FJ40 Land Cruiser. It put a modern spin on its predecessor's design and grew a pair of suicide rear doors for a tinge of practicality. It could go far off the beaten path thanks to suspension and chassis components borrowed from Toyota's other trucks, including the Tacoma and 4Runner. Look closely and you'll notice the FJ Cruiser shares a quirk with the MGB its short, wide windshield required using three wipers. Production for the American market ended in 2014, but Toyota continued offering the FJ in Japan until a few months ago. The FJ developed a strong following in the years after its U.S. demise. The FT4X concept unveiled at the New York show earlier this year hints at a potential successor. As a muscle car for the 21st century, the Dodge Challenger competes in the same segment as the Ford Mustang and the Chevrolet Camaro. It's the only one not sold in Europe. That's due to its titanic size, market regulations it most likely doesn't comply with and Dodge's largely non-existent brand presence. Can you imagine the Challenger sharing showroom space with a 500 from sister brand Fiat? The Challenger is also the most outdated car in its competitive set. It's approaching 10 years old and it rides on a platform cobbled together with Chrysler and Mercedes-Benz parts that should have retired years ago. Dodge has nonetheless leveraged its heritage to give the Challenger an undeniably sporty flair while keeping it interesting. Heritage-laced paint colors and top-spec variants like the Hellcat and the Demon add desirability to this forbidden fruit. Based on the Ford F-150, the original Raptor was a street-legal Baja racer built to fly across sand pits with American swagger. It benefited from comprehensive suspension upgrades, 35-inch tires and a locking rear differential. Early models shipped with a 5.4-liter V8, but the optional 6.2-liter, 411-horsepower V8 became standard in 2011. For its second generation, the Raptor lost a pair of cylinders as it switched to Ford's twin-turbocharged, 450-horsepower EcoBoost V6. Even big American trucks fall victim to downsizing. The off-road hardware under the sheet metal is as serious as ever, giving the Raptor over a foot of wheel travel to hop from June to June. The Honda Accord had two personalities until 2015. In Europe, it was a premium economy model, related to the Acura TSX sold in America. In the US, it was a much more basic machine that bundled a tremendous amount of value in a package basic enough to appeal to anyone seeking just a car. While Honda's European division axed the Accord and abandoned the segment in 2015, the nameplate soldiers on across the Atlantic, where it's brand new for the 2018 model year. It's better than ever, and offers a handsome design, sharp handling, excellent fuel economy and abundant tech features at a wallet-friendly price. Prices start at $22,205, $800 less than the cheapest Toyota Camry.